Okay, so uh, thank you everybody again for joining us today. And we're going to jump in into the first presentation. So, so we are honored and excited to have Dr. Scott Coffin with the State Water Resources Control Board, who uh, is going to be talking about microplastics monitoring and uh, management. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Vivian, and it's great to be here. So by now we've all seen images like this in the media. It seems that everywhere we look from the deepest part of the ocean, the Mariana Trench, all the way up to the highest mountain in the world, we find plastic particles. Um, if you're curious about the, the rate of how much plastic enters the ocean every year, uh, it's estimated that about one garbage truck goes in the ocean every minute. Um, this is a, a festival that happens in Huntington Beach every year where they actually intentionally dump plastic ducks into the ocean. It's a bit ironic uh, in, uh, considering all things. And so where does this plastic end up? A lot of it goes out into the open ocean and a lot of it uh, eventually will sink down to the ocean floor. And it's estimated that there is a garbage patch off of the coast of California that is approximately twice as large as Texas. And a misconception about this is that it's really uh, an island. Um, in reality, most of these particles are the smaller end. Uh, you cannot see them with the naked eye and they don't float on, directly on the surface. They're just right below the surface. Uh, this is what the garbage patch actually looks like. Uh, these are images taken from folks that have been out there, uh, Captain Charlie Moore, Dr. Miriam Goldstein, and then uh, from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. It doesn't look like much, but if you were to grab a sample of water, um, you would see these plastic particles, and if you were to tr trawl a net, you would see a very large concentration of particles. So why do we care about plastic in the ocean and uh, for humans? Plastic doesn't just go away, it tends to degrade into smaller and smaller particles that can become bio-accessible to humans and different biota. So for instance, plastic microbeads used to be added to a lot of toothpastes. This is now banned in the United States. But looking at these particles, if you were to zoom in on one of those particles, you can see on the surface of that particle, lots of other little plastic particles that are shedding. And if you were to zoom in on one of those little particles, you would see even more particles. So here we can see from one microplastic, billions of nanoplastics uh, can easily form and, and, and uh, become bioaccessible. So now I wanna test everyone's knowledge. And um, if you can just, add the or click on the link that I dropped into the chat right now. I'm really curious to, to see what, what people think of as the what what of these products is the most abundant on the surface of the open ocean, uh, just based on your knowledge. So click the link, um, choose your or rank these and then we'll see how we compare with uh, what the literature says. Uh, if you're on a phone uh, or if you're looking on a computer, you can also just pull out your phone and scan the QR code, whatever is easiest for you. And we'll give it just a minute and then I will show you all the results. All righty. So uh, apologies for those who couldn't see it. Now let's see. Oh, there we go. So it looks like everyone's ranking them pretty equally. Uh, plastic bags and wrappers, food containers and cutlery, plastic bottles and fishing related gear. Uh, so no clear winner here. Um, let's see what the, the literature says. So clearly um, fishing related gear is by far the number one source of plastic in the floating open ocean, 60%. Uh, um, the next biggest category is plastic water bottles, plastic bags and wrappers, and then food containers and cutlery only makes up 1%. That's not to say that this is the uh, uh, division of how much plastic is used uh, globally, not by any means. But what we learn from this is that the majority of plastic in the ocean comes from the ocean it comes from people out on the ocean, not from land. This is a relatively recent discovery and is the result of many years of monitoring. Um, in 2022, uh, a comprehensive survey of plastic floating in the ocean gyres found that uh, fishing gear, uh, floats and buoys, crates and buckets um, are the vast majority of, of plastic out there. Um, 
fragments, which probably come from all of these materials, are, are the, the next biggest category, uh, and then household items and others. So, well, like I mentioned before, the fishing industry uh, has recently been found to be dominating the, the plastic that's out in the open ocean, and it really depends on where you're looking. Of, of the the, the dominant the, the dominant form of plastic. So, for instance, if you're looking inland uh, on a river, the vast majority of plastic we find is from land, from food containers. Um, fishing gear is almost non-existent. Um, the closer you get to uh, the, the open ocean, um, the more likely the fishing-related gear is going to dominate. Um, on the deep sea floor, we actually see it. Uh, uh, plastic water bottles and bags are the, the dominant forms of plastic. And this is likely due to a lot of the, the fishing related gear uh, doesn't sink. It's, it's, more, it's made to be buoyant. Um, ropes and fishing lines are, are, are lower density. And so this might surprise some of us. In 1969, this was the first ever scientific finding of plastic being ingested by marine organisms. They found 90 out of 91 Lazen albatross had recognizable pieces of plastics in their gut on a remote island in Hawaii. This was an uninhabited island uh, uh, off the coast of Hawaii. So this was quite surprising for the, the authors. And it wasn't for, for many years that we actually determined what this does to these organisms. Um, we also have recently discovered that marine paints are a significant source of microplastics into the world's oceans. Um, it's estimated that 450,000 tons of marine coatings are produced annually. 50% of that paint is actually made of plastic. And between 3 and 90% of that is shed by boats annually. That's an enormous range. So if you have, what they found is high quality paint doesn't shed very quickly. So it's not contributing a whole lot of microplastics to the ocean. You probably all know that with uh, the quality of your paint. Um, you don't have to paint it many times if you if you choose the good stuff. So this is this is really something that um, it can you you can do something about if you you choose higher paints, you have to paint it less, um, less plastic pollution. This is what these particles look like uh, out in the, the environment. Again, this probably all looks uh, quite familiar to those that have had to uh, remove the paint or, or, or add more paint to their boats. So what is the California government doing about all of this? We have two legislative mandates to deal specifically with microplastics. And this is quite unique to the state of California. Senate Bill 1263 was passed in 2018 and requires the Ocean Protection Council and the State Water Board to initiate a statewide microplastic strategy by the 2022. By 2026, we're required to develop a risk assessment framework, get standardized analytical methods, and go out and actually use them and do monitoring in the environment, figure out how plastics are getting into our oceans, and then go back to the legislature with some source reduction strategies. In 2017, the first study to ever look for microplastics in drinking water found them in 83% of samples worldwide and 94% of samples in the United States. This was quite surprising for, for a lot of us and, and made a big impact on specifically some legislators in California. They passed Senate Bill 1422, which has similar objectives to Senate Bill 1263, except it's focused narrowly on drinking water. Here, the State Water Board was required to first define microplastics by 2020, and then by 2021, adopt a standardized method for monitoring, a plan for four years of testing and analysis of microplastics in California's drinking water supplies, consider adopting a health-based guidance level so that when we tell consumers you have X number of microplastics in your drinking water, we can tell them approximately what that means for their health. And then finally, to accredit laboratories so that we feel reliable about their results. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these steps, starting off with a standardized analytical method. At the time of these bills, there was no analytical methods for monitoring microplastics that had undergone any sort of harmonization or standardization. So we took the lead and developed two methods using spectroscopy and performed an inter-laboratory validation study with 26 laboratories from seven different countries. And we did this not only for drinking water, but also for ocean water, fish tissue, and sediment. The lab's uh, laboratory accreditation is available now. Uh, this interlaboratory study was, was highly successful and we're able to accredit laboratories for monitoring drinking water right now. Um, this is a fairly uh, uh, straightforward process and any laboratory anywhere in the world can apply for California ELAP uh, accreditation. So we actually have a laboratory from Australia that's gonna be one of the first labs to get accredited. 
So another of the legislative mandates was to evaluate the risks to humans through drinking water and the ecological risks. So I'll walk you through what we did uh, to, to uh, meet these legislative mandates. Again, when these bills were passed, the state of the science on microplastics was nascent, and there were no ecological health thresholds that had been uh, thoroughly reviewed or adopted by any government agency. So again, we had to do a little bit of research here. We, we held a health effects workshop and we charged the participants, uh, these are experts in the field, with determining what the dose metrics are that determine a particle's harm. What are the particle characteristics that, that make these microplastics more or less toxic? What are the effects that we actually see in organisms? And can we use all this information to derive a threshold framework to inform management? First, it's important to understand what we mean by risk as toxicologists. Risk is defined as the combination of hazard and exposure. For instance, some sharks are hazardous, some are more or less hazardous to humans. And if you are not exposed to the shark, there is no risk. Um, the, the more exposure you have, the higher probability you have of being harmed by that hazard. So I'll talk first about the hazards of microplastics. We know that there's that microplastics cause harm to many different organisms in three different ways. Chemical-based hazards, where the, the actual chemicals added to the plastics are being desorbed and cause harm. Biological-based hazard, hazards, where pathogens and other bacteria hitchhike on the plastic particles uh, and, and can, uh, increase exposure. And the particles themselves can become lodged in tissue and cause additional toxicity. So plastic contains many hazardous chemicals, at least 10,000 known additives, of which 2,400 are substances of concern, meaning they're, they're toxic, persistent, uh, or cause developmental or reproductive harm. 53% of those are unregulated in the United States, and 11% have no information whatsoever. So we have no idea what they're doing. In terms of looking at the toxicity of particles, with microplastics, we focused on the particle-based toxicity for this, uh, this initial effort. And I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit about how we addressed Senate Bill 1422's requirement to adopt a health-based guidance level. First, let's talk about the exposure to humans. Uh, I'm sure all of you have seen some of the headlines that have been in the news recently discovering microplastics in different uh, compartments within humans. So in the majority of people tested, we've found microplastics in lungs, blood, placenta, and recently in breast milk. And if you follow TikTok or Instagram, you'll probably know that, uh, that the millennials are know a lot about microplastics and there's a lot of uh, uh, fun memes out there. One might le lead you to believe that microplastics is actually the base of the food chain for humans. Um, it's true that we are exposed at very high quantities. However, it's important to, to understand um, exactly the, the, the magnitude of exposure. And so now, I want, again, I want to test your knowledge. Uh, so I just launched a poll. Um, I'll drop the link back in the chat just so everyone has it handy. Um, you, can, you can test your knowledge and see. Uh, let, let, let's rank the, these different exposure pathways of microplastics to humans by their relative magnitude. So which of these which of these has the most microplastics uh, and, and which, which we get the most from. So I'll give folks just another minute to participate. Really appreciate all the participation here. We've got 23 people that have already filled this out. All righty, so here's the results. It looks like uh, far and away people voted for tap water, then fish then bottled water, then air, then sea salt. So I'm sure you're all curious to know what the data says. So here are some, what we call violin plots. Um, it's basically a fancy box plot. And you can see here that the, uh, they are very, very wide. 
what this means is there's a lot of variability in terms of the contamination and the exposure. So people may be drinking a lot. Some people may drink many, many more uh, uh, single-use plastic water bottles than other people. So they're going to have higher exposure and lower. Some bottled water is going to have very high concentrations. Some bottled water is going to have very low concentrations. This is kind of across the board. Um, so first off, high variability. But if we were to rank them, we would find that air is actually uh, several orders of magnitude higher exposure than any other exposure route. So the, 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 the air that we breathe every day in our home is relatively contaminated with microplastics coming from our, our carpets, rugs, and upholstery. Number two is tap water. Number three is bottled water. Bottled water actually contains three times more microplastics than tap water on average, but people don't drink bottled water nearly as much as tap water. So it's a lower relative magnitude. Uh, mollusks um, uh, are the number four. Uh, mollusks tend to have the highest amount of microplastics of any organism in, in the sea that we eat, followed by salt. So number five is salt. So when it comes to drinking water, let's, what do we know about the treatment techniques that are available to remove microplastics? Most drink, drinking water treatment plants that have surface water as their source water are already removing microplastics with conventional treatment techniques that remove other particles. You're removing at least half of the, of the microplastics just through the first stage of sedimentation. Further treatment techniques like filtration and granular activated carbon are going to reduce even more microplastics. But what's important to understand here is the size. Uh, what's shown here is these different, these different colors. Uh, textures, you can see that the majority of the particles that are remaining in the treated water are very small, between 1 and 10 micrometers. Uh, these are particles that you can barely see with a microscope, and unfortunately these are the particles that we are most concerned about from a toxicity point of view, as they can become lodged in our tissue. In terms of bottled water, I mentioned before, three times higher concentrations on average than tap water. This is because the bottle itself sheds microplastics. Every time you unscrew the lid from a plastic water bottle, it's releasing some microplastics between 14 and 2400, according to this one study. That'll go into the air, it'll go into the water, uh, and, and if you repeat this on a daily basis, you're getting relatively high exposure. So talked a bit about human exposure. Let's go back to the concept of hazard. What does our what does these exposure values mean for our health? To address this issue, we did a literature review on all of the studies that have exposed animals to uh, mammalian animals to microplastics through food or drinking water. We found just 29 studies. This is a relatively small database, but we were able to screen these for reliability and relevance to risk assessment. And we found 12 of these are deemed fit for purpose for, for, for informing risk assessment. We then thoroughly evaluated each of these studies with experts in the field, both in microplastics and the physiological field of interest for each study. Based on this comprehensive review, we found that there are at least four studies that report consistent impacts to male reproduction when exposing these organisms to microplastics. A range of different male reproductive endpoints were affected, including sperm deformity, lower sperm count, lower testosterone, and a range of other impacts, suggesting that there are that the male reproductive system is sensitive to exposure to microplastics, at least in rodents. We also found two studies that reported impacts to anti-mullerian hormone concentration, which is a reliable biomarker for female reproductive success, both in rodents and in humans. Two studies reported impacts to body weight, and one study reported an impact to liver. We were not able to derive a regulatory level from these studies due to three main factors. One is that the effects database is largely inadequate. We're dealing with a contaminant suite that ranges in thousands of unique polymers and a diversity of shapes, sizes, colors, and adsorbed contaminants. The vast majority of these studies only used one type of particle, which was usually polystyrene spheres of a very particular size. So it's not possible to relate polystyrene spheres of one size to the universe of snowflakes of, part of microplastics that we're exposed to daily. 
the effect mechanisms, how these microplastics actually cause harm to the male reproductive system and these other systems is not fully fleshed out. We have pretty good ideas, but we need more information in order to extrapolate to this diverse particle types. We have incomplete exposure data. We don't know what we're, what we're eating in the majority of our food, and we don't have harmonized drinking water exposure data. So what are we doing for testing? Um, I mentioned before, Senate Bill 1422 requires that we have four years of testing and monitoring in California. And this is being accomplished through a three-phase iterative approach. The first phase is currently underway. We're calling the pilot phase, where we're doing additional research and building infrastructure. Starting late 2023, some water systems in California will actually start monitoring for microplastics in their source waters, and they'll be reporting this to consumers. Uh, around 2025, we'll have another phase and, and do additional monitoring. Um, the majority of the water systems that are going to receive uh, these, these initial orders are in the highly populated areas in California. So around the Bay Area, around Los Angeles, some in San Diego. We stri strive to get um, some ge geospatial diversity in here. So we also have some systems in the Central Valley and in Northern California. So that's enough about human health and drinking water. Let's get back to what's happening in the marine environment. Senate Bill 1263 requires we develop a risk assessment framework. I talked about the risk assessment, the framework that we did for humans, but for, for ecological systems, this has been something we've been studying for quite a long time. And again, I'm curious to know um, what you all guess as to when was the first scientific study documenting microplastics in the environment. So earlier I showed that study documenting plastic pollution in, uh, in, in Lays and Albatross. That was in 1969. Um, here the question is actual microplastic particles. And I will give you all a moment to give me your best guesses. I'm sure that this will surprise the vast majority of you uh, when we actually started to pay, pay mind to this issue. Scott, we need the link. All righty, I will drop the link in again. Thank Here you, we go. Scott. Perfect. Thanks for speaking up. Appreciate that. All right, so I'm going to show you all what, uh, there's a clear winner right now. Um, 1992, 47% uh, of people say 1992, followed by 1982, then 1962. No one voted for the right answer, uh, which is 1972. Um, this is actually a, a, this is a very well done paper. This was uh, in the journal Science by uh, Drs. Carpenter and Smith. They're at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and they were looking for uh, Sargasso on the Sargasso Sea. They found all these white, squishy pellets in their samples that were not any sort of marine organism that they had seen before. And so many, so much contamination that they decided to start counting them and documenting them. And they determined that they, they, they repeated this a year later and they found higher concentrations than in the year before. They also speculated that, hey, these plastic particles, they probably are picking up contaminants that are concentrating them, uh, PCBs and uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And they actually measured those on the particles. Um, they hypothesized that fish could eat these particles and get really high doses of PCBs causing harm. And they speculated that increasing production of plastics combined with present waste disposal practices will undoubtedly lead to increases in the concentration of these particles. So how did we get from this groundbreaking study in 1972 to effectively no information for decades? And there's, a, there's quite an interesting story behind this, but um, in short, the lead researcher was visited by a representative from the Society of Plastics Industry in Michigan shortly after publishing this paper, and the, the uh, science stopped after that point. So there was no scientific studies coming out of this lab on plastic pollution after that. Since then, there's been quite a few studies, mostly most of these, um, oh, sorry. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, zoom past some of this, but um, 
I want I want you all to understand that microplastics can cause cause harm to humans or to, to to organisms in many different ways. And the state water board already has regulatory thresholds uh, in place for microplastics. Um, these were derived again from our expert panel, and I just want to end with a couple things. Um, let's see. So as part of our statewide microplastic strategy. This is something that is currently underway and that you all can help with uh, at, by by um, informing our science and informing the solutions. So right now we have a two track approach to address microplastic pollution, including solutions, uh, no regret solutions that we can take today, pollution prevention, pathway intervention, outreach and education. Um, outreach and education is something that you all can do in your daily practice, um, as well as informing uh, track two, which is a science to inform future action, doing additional monitoring, assessing risks, figuring out how plastics are getting into the environment and implementing solutions, and then evaluating the efficacy of those solutions. So um, I don't want to go too far over time, and I do want to leave some time for questions. So I'm just going to uh, leave it there and then and pass it over to Vivian to, to uh, field some questions. So thank you all for your attention. Wow, Scott, what, what a great presentation. Tons of <clears throat> amazing information. Very sad, but at the same time, <clears throat> with a lot of opportunities for us as part of the public also to do some uh, um, actions on a daily basis. And I want just to open it up for the members of the meeting to please, um, you know, open your microphone and feel free to ask questions. Or if you want to utilize the chat to ask questions, I see John. John, please uh, welcome and identify yourself, so then you can ask the questions to Scott, please. Yeah, thank, thanks, Vivian. Uh, Scott, John Fisher with the uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary out of Santa Cruz. And um, before you uh, drop that bullet on us about uh, the plastics industry, my, my comment was going to be, um, are, are we working actively, right? Uh, you know, polymers is oil. Are we working formally, you know, other than uh, us doing the research and the lab work and then uh, without going back to the source. Is it a more positive impact now? There's been quite a few actions in the state level that address the source of the issue, which I believe is, the, is what you're getting at. Right now, uh, the Attorney General of California, uh, Rob Bonta, is suing the biggest plastic producers for their decades long deception to the public that recycling does something. And this is a multi-million dollar lawsuit. We also passed in July of this year, Senate Bill 54. Uh, this is the Plastic Pollution Reduction Act. And this requires industry to pay $15 billion to California over the next 10 years to mitigate the damages that they've already done, the plastic industry has already done to the public. It also requires that we meet certain recycling and composting targets by different years. So uh, by 2035, the state is required to have a 68% recycling or composting rate. Uh, so we are trying, we are prioritizing reduction at this point. Okay, th th thank you. And we'll, we'll do what we can on the uh, deck plate level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom? <clears throat> yes, thanks. Uh, Scott, terrific presentation. Thank you. I was already horrified. Now I'm, I don't even know what to do with my hands right now. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, aside from just pronounced source reduction, uh, I'm curious if, if you think there's some intermediary uh, pathways. And I mean, you spoke to a lot of the efforts by the state here to, you know, to reduce this. Is there, is there a such thing as a good plastic? Maybe that's what I'm asking. So in terms of pathways, um, I suppose there's, there's multiple different ways you can think about it. We are always going to have plastic pollution even if we transition to compostable plastics. Um, our, our clothing, it, it, we like polyester clothing, we like synthetic clothing, that's not gonna go away anytime soon. And it turns out that is one of the major sources of microplastics to our environment. The best way that you can prevent those microfibers from reaching the environment is a filter in your washing machine. France already requires all new washing machines to have a microfiber filter, and California is exploring that in a, from a policy perspective. Um, what is the next plastic? What is going to replace? What is going to replace all these single-use plastics? Is it going to be better or worse than our current 
uh, what we currently have. And this is something that we are working actively uh, with experts from around the world to figure out so that we can choose plastics that are not regrettable alternatives. Great question, Thank you, Scott. I'm going to combine two questions that we have in the chat, which are pretty similar from, um, hold on for a sec, uh, from um, Heidi Hill and Douglas, uh, forgot his last name, Pelt, I think it is, Pelton. Uh, is there a link or resources to any citizen science actions where the community can learn on ways on how to get involved that you may know in, so we can share with the, with the group? Absolutely. So um, I will drop a link to my uh, one of the websites that I manage, which aggregates all of the different information and tools and databases for plastic pollution. Right here, there are six different citizen science programs. Uh, some of them are local, some of them are not. Um, we also, uh, on here is the Marine Debris Tracker app as well. Um, there's also a, a group called Literati. Um, I'll type it into the chat. And this is a, 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 a an organization that has they made a, a, an app where you can go to a street corner or beach or whatever take a photo and the ai will identify all of the plastic in that photo and tell you what it is and how much there is and you can do that um, on a, 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 a you know a daily weekly monthly basis and you can track it builds it, it shows the accumulation and where their hot spots that's actually used by different locales in california to figure out where they can put bins and street sweeping and and where they should focus their efforts thank you scott and i'll send in a follow-up email those links so you know also want to invite everybody i know we have a couple of other questions um, to also participate in uh, the largest volunteer event, which is Coastal Cleanup Day, as you know, managed by the California Coastal Commission. You can also do daily cleanups by using uh, the cleanup uh, uh, that we have, the app that is managed by the Ocean Conservancy. So that's something that you can also do. Uh, we're taking a couple of, uh, two more questions. And I saw Dave, Dave Booker have a uh, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question and welcome. Right. Thank you very much. Can you talk, just touch on what the federal agencies are doing in this regard? I know that you're very much involved with the state and you talked about that. How about the, the good friends in Washington, D.C.? A number of things. Uh, when it comes to microplastics in particular, the uh, Food and Drug Administration has a fairly robust working group that is focused at this point on analytical method uh, validation and, and development, um, trying to get a handle on exposure first, uh, and then trying to figure out the hazards. The US EPA uh, Office of Research and Development uh, over in Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island, has been uh, also working on method development, looking at sediments, and they're running a, a couple of toxicity studies looking for, for uh, harm to different marine organisms. And then from a policy perspective, um, the, the White House actually just issued a call for uh, a special project uh, about two weeks ago, and they're trying to get a good handle on the risks and develop a risk assessment framework, very similar to what California has already done. Thank you. We have one question. I'm going to take the question from the chat and then the last one from Lisa. Uh, Peggy Ciolino, hopefully I properly pr pronounce your last name, Ch Peggy, sorry about that. Would it be, um, would it help if we went <clears throat> back to glass bottles? So in this case, this is, this is a, a question of what is the environmental impact of the materials that we use? And we have to think about more than just the formation of microplastics as shipping materials can also cause other impacts our environment through increased uh, greenhouse gas emissions from from the trucks shipping those things and so really what we should be thinking about is there's not a one-size-fits-all solution to, the, to all these things it's really on a case-by-case -case basis so for instance um, glass bottles being uh, uh, staying in a community um, like they historically have you know for milk distribution beer distribution uh, uh, soda that is probably the best use of those materials because they're not being shipped all the way around the world but if you're buying your glass bottles from australia um, the, think about the climate impacts and, and you have to balance those with the plastic impacts right Thank you, Scott. And the last question would be from Lisa. Lisa, go ahead and unmute yourself and welcome. 
Thank you. Um, I'm curious what the impact that NGOs like the Ocean Cleanup are having on ocean plastics and are governments able to work with those type of organizations like NGOs and university labs to coordinate on research and action? Great question. So um, there, I know of two uh, ocean cleanup uh, organizations. One is called the Ocean Cleanup. There's another one that is also trying to do the very similar thing. As far as what they've accomplished in terms of removing plastic from the ocean, I think at this point it's still in the demonstration and pilot phase. But recently the Ocean Cleanup has focused a lot more on monitoring and documenting uh, the plastic in the ocean. And, and they've uh, just wrapped up the most comprehensive monitoring campaign conducted to date for plastic pollution, which is uh, information that directly is usable by government organizations and we've been collaborating with them. Wow, great, great topic. <clears throat> Scott, it's always a, an honor and a pleasure to listen to you. We all learn so much and thank you for what California again is doing, always being ahead of the game here. So thank you so much for that. Um, <clears throat> for the rest of the group, this is being recorded. We are going to share with you uh, the recording and also in a follow-up email, you will have the emails from all of the presenters. So you can, you know, sometimes we need time to digest the information. So if you come up with another question, Scott is fantastic responding to emails. <clears throat> so we will do that. I also wanted to mention that in the agenda, I didn't create a, a, a break a time for all of us because we are joining virtually. So you can come in and out of the meeting because the, the agenda is pretty packed and time is valuable for all of us. All right, so Scott, thank you so much. And now we're going to switch gears and learn a little bit about wells of the California coast. And we're switching gears and we're excited and honored also to have Janeira Quigley, who is the executive director with the uh, Ocean Connector. So welcome, Janeira, and thank you for being with all of us today. Hi, thank you. Um, and oops, I'm sharing the wrong screen, perhaps. Let me look. It's difficult when I have two screens up sometimes. <laughs> no are you worries, you are there. for conservation. Okay, just checking because I lost my my Zoom screen when I did that. Um, okay, so um, I'm Janera. Thank you so much for having me. I'm the executive director at Ocean Connectors, and um, we are an education organization. We operate out of San Diego as well as down in Nayarit, Mexico. Um, and the reason we're in those two locations um, in southern San Diego Bay, there is um, a community and it's extremely industrialized um, right along the border and the folks don't have access uh, to the coastal ecosystem, their recreation, things like that. It is also a location where it was identified um, previously in, in 2007 that that's where green sea turtles were nesting. And so getting the education out to the public in that area was important. Same thing in Nayarit, Mexico. Um, we are all along the coast there. Um, it's a community that is extremely impoverished and relies on the tourism industry um, for survival. And that's also where our sea turtles are nesting. And so we do education programs in the schools and we also run eco tour programs to, to fund these education programs. Um, I'm the executive director. I'm also a, um, a professor at University of San Diego. So thank you for having me. Um, and still, because I'm on two screens, I'm not seeing what you guys are seeing. Are you seeing uh, Let's Play a Game? Correct. Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so we'll help you. No that. worries. You guys will have to bear with me. I know what it's like when we uh, when we share multiple screens. So you I'm stopped, actually you gonna share your screen. So you yeah, I stopped. It. I'm going to share another screen. We're going to play a game. I'd like to get um, just a baseline for where everybody is um, where everybody is at on their whale knowledge. So let's put this up. I'm going to start this game. And if you could go on your phones and type in kahoot.it, K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. And when you get there, it's going to look like this. It's going to ask you for a game pin, 143981. 
And when you type that in, you can enter in your name or a nickname or anything that you'd like to show up on the screen. Great, everybody's jumping in. I love this, you guys are so fun. <laughs> and this is the teacher in me. I love doing fun things. Um, I believe there's about 60 of us in the meeting. The game will only hold 50. So I'll give it a, a few more minutes. Um, otherwise you can all, uh, you can see this. So that I can start up as soon as I get a few folks more in. All right, okay. We're gonna get started. It's gonna be really self-explanatory. I think you guys are gonna enjoy this. All right, first question, and you're gonna answer on your phone. I have seen a whale while boating along the California coast. Let's see how we're doing as far as. All right, so 19 of you out of 27 answered, yes, you have. Um, they are pretty enigmatic and sometimes we're not always thinking about whales and we're gonna get to that in just a minute why that's important. Next question, you can select more than one. What types of whales are found off of the California coast? Okay. So the correct answer is actually all four. And I'm gonna share with you where they're at at what times along the coast. Because again, when we're boating, that's gonna be important information to know where they're at so that we can boat safely. Um, okay, let's take a look. All right, Lisa S seems to be in the lead. Great job, that's awesome. Okay, question three of four, while stranding incidents Oops, sorry. Whale stranding incidents have blank over recent years. Strandings are when they get beached and they end up on shore. So they've increased, decreased, stayed the same, or you're not sure. Increased, correct, they have. Lisa is still in the lead. Great job, Lisa. Okay, last question here. And you can choose more than one. What would you do if you saw a whale in distress? This one should be fairly simple. You can choose more than one. Okay, good, nobody said stop, drop and roll. That's excellent. Uh, report on the whale alert app. I am gonna give you some information on that in this presentation. You can also call this uh, hotline and I will put that in the chat when the presentation is done as well. It's definitely something if you're on the water that you're gonna wanna have handy. Um, and let's see who our winner is. This is the fun part. The part V, V is our winner. Congratulations. Eric came in second and number one that goes to Lisa. <laughs> Great. I hope you guys, uh, hope you guys enjoyed that one. That was fun. Let me um, give you one second. I'm gonna turn that off really quickly. And okay. So moving on, why we're talking about whales and whale strandings um, in the boating community. And this is an important topic because not something that we think about on the daily. And um, for any of you guys who are like me, I'm teaching my teenage sons to drive. Something that they're not thinking about is they're driving through the neighborhoods is, you know, a dog could come running out and how 
hurtful that would be like if you accidentally hit a dog, you would be absolutely devastated. And so what are some of the precautions that you can take to make sure that that's not happening as you're driving through the neighborhood? Not always, um, not always something that we think about when we're boating, but it's a very real risk. And yes, I am going to share my screen okay. again. I do have Thank you. some slides. Sure. Of course. Um, so. And now we um, can see the importance of whales is like, just so you know. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. So the importance of whales. So we're going to discuss whales, why they're important to our ecosystem, um, why they're important to our, our economy, and then how we can prevent accidentally striking them or causing them harm as we are boating off the coast. So first of all, uh, the importance of whales. I don't think, I mean, they are very majestic animals and we love to see them and we want to go whale watching. That is one of the eco tours that we provide. We wanna get up as close as we can to them, um, but we don't always think of what purpose they actually do serve in our ecosystem. And so I wanted to share with you really quickly a concept called the whale pump. And whales are the top predator in the ocean and they actually serve a huge function in being able to cycle nutrients. And so they're, because of their excrement, they are um, providing protein and fueling the phytoplankton at the top. They're also feeding on bottom fish and getting those proteins to raise up. And it actually, you know, in, in layman's terms, creates this pump where resources and nutrients are cycled um, through the ecosystem. Extremely important. They're one of the only um, animals that do this in off the coast. And so it's a, just another reason to make sure that we're protecting them. Um, and this slide I thought was really interesting because I never thought of putting a dollar amount on what an animal does in the ecosystem, but somebody, you know, took this up and decided to take a look. Um, in the fishing industry, it's estimated that over $150, or $150 billion um, are contributed by the whales um, to the food chain. Um, the whale watching industry uh, creates $2 billion globally each year. Um, the carbon sequesters 33 tons um, as the whales are, are consuming um, the carbon. And then when they die, it's going down to the bottom of the ocean floor. Um, and the phytoplankton productivity that I mentioned um, is enhanced when whales, um, they capture 32 billion tons of CO2 per year. So as we talk about carbon uptake and um, the addition of carbon to our atmosphere, whales are playing a huge role in actually sequestering that. So there is definitely, um, it's important that, that we're protecting them on those levels as well, not just because they're these amazing animals that we wanna try to protect. Um, in our fun little game, we discussed uh, the four whales that we might see off of the coast. And the gray whale um, is definitely the one that we see when you go whale watching, when you're you know, boating or sailing out to the islands. Uh, we see the gray whale a lot. And it's actually the Pacific stock is not endangered. Other stocks are. Um, but the gray whale is the one that we're most likely to see, and it does stick pretty close to the coast. And I'll show you a, a map in just a little bit. Um, the blue whale is endangered. That's the largest of our marine man mammals. The fin whale, you, you're very unlikely to see that one. I've seen a few off the coast of San Diego. It's extremely fast. If it breaches, you're probably not gonna see it again. It'll be a mile down the way before you even know it, uh, before it comes up again. And then the humpback whale. So uh, the humpback whale is also endangered. Um, oops, I clicked too quickly, but that's okay. So we're gonna look at the routes of the whales. And this is important to know because whales are migrating at different times during the year. And they also move out like some are very close to the coast and they come right up the coastline. And some, as you can see, are way out in the Pacific. And so if we're boating, it's important to know if we're right up along the coast between the months of December to April, we're going to experience lots of gray whales at that time. Um, the blue whales, their migration happens a little bit later, um, and, but they're also much farther out to sea. 
So we need to know, you know, when we're likely to see those whales and um, just to be on the lookout and understand, you know, as we're moving through the water, what, what potentially could be there and what we could see. Um, moving on, threats to whale populations. Um, so it used to be that uh, whaling was the largest reason that the whales were endangered. Um, they were they were getting fished. They were um, we were using them for oils, things like that. So um, in the 20th century, most whales became endangered, and it was because we were actually hunting for whales. Since then, that's not the case um, anymore. There's lots of other threats, including bycatch, which is when you know fishermen accidentally get the whales caught in the nets. Um, the pollution, the, the plastics that, that Scott was uh, sharing with us, as well as oil spills, things like that, and then boat strikes. We don't typically think about boat strikes, but it's a very real danger. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So bycatch is actually one of the largest threats to marine mammals. Um, and if you have any questions on that, we have marine scientists on the team. Happy to give you some additional information. I know that that doesn't necessarily, um, isn't relevant for most people and the people that are in that industry um, that are attending meetings like this and things like that are already aware of, um, of what can be done to, to mitigate that. Um, the pollution issue is a major, major threat. So plastics, they're ingesting plastics um, through the water, eating, eating the plastic bags. I think we've seen that. They think that they're jellyfish, the plastic straws, PCBs, um, oil spills are extremely harmful. Um, and then one that we don't think of often, um, and I know not everybody's from San Diego, but it's a big problem in San Diego, is the sonar used by boats and that interferes with their echolocation and it gets them very disoriented. And a lot of times because there is sonar in the water in some of these bays, um, they can't hear or see um, the boats coming. And so what you would think is, okay, I'm in this very loud boat, they're gonna stay away. A lot of times they're very disoriented and they're not gonna be able to do that. Um, so boat strikes, so how does this happen? And so these are the reported boat strikes. And if you can imagine, I mean, if you hit a whale in the water, I mean, that would be absolutely devastating. So they expect that this number is much higher, but people don't know what to do with that information. If they hit a whale, like who, who do you call? You don't know who to call. Um, I will put that number uh, in the chat for you in a little bit. Um, but the reason this happens, a couple, the sonar is one. The second is that when people are whale watching, they want to get up real close so that they can see the whales, but the whales are, are going back down, they're fishing, they're playing, and they'll come back up and not realize, you know, that the, the boat has moved in so closely and they can hit the boat when they come up. Another really um, important reason for this is it's called a null effect with the boats because boats are moving through the water this way. Many of them create this, this buffer around and um, whales are judging and sensing by pressure. They don't feel that coming. You can hear and feel a boat when you're behind it because you feel the waves coming. They can't hear it or sense it from in front. So if a boat is approaching them, they can't feel that. So just something to keep in mind, they're not necessarily gonna know you're coming. Um, so there have been whale strandings and it is increasing where the whales are washing ashore and they're trying to understand how, how did this happen? Um, so NOAA states that whale strandings have increased significantly across the West Coast since 2019. Um, the deaths are classified as unusual mortality events. Um, 454 gray whales were, strand, were stranded in the last two years in the US, Canada, and Mexico. And most of them are expected or suspected, I should say, um, to be caused by boat strikes, that they're disoriented from the sonar and the boats are striking them. 
which is really, it's terrible, it's sad. Um, couple, I'll, I'll share a couple quick cases with you from off the California coast. Here's some pictures of some whale watchers that got in too close and hit um, a humpback whale. And then over here, again, I apologize for the, for the sad pictures, but we really wanna make sure that, you know, we're taking this in and, and understanding the real danger. Um, and there was, you know, a mom and a calf that everybody loved to see as she migrated through in San Francisco and, and the sonar uh, disoriented her and she was, she was struck. Um, so how can we help, right? What do we, what do we do with this information? We know it's terrible. We know it's sad. We know we want to protect them. We know how important they are. Um, so passage planning is one. And so when we send out this, um, this presentation, I will share with you some of the maps so that you can see, okay, where are the whales? You know, if I'm planning my passage and I'm way off the coast and I'm at this time of year, I'm likely to see, say, humpback whales or things like that. So you'll be able to know what you're looking for or, okay, I'm actually, we're, we're pretty safe. Right now is not time for them to be migrating. We, we should be in a good spot. Um, keeping watch. So like I said, they're not necessarily going to hear or see or feel you coming. So uh, keeping watch and keeping your distance if you are whale watching and if you see them. Um, I believe it's a hundred yards. We're supposed to stay back, but as far back as you can stay because you don't know where they're going to breach again. And then reporting incidents. So we do have the whale stranding hotline that you can call and that can get folks out there to see if they can offer assistance. Um, if there's whales trapped in nets, things like that. Um, so we can, we can report it that way. Um, and then one thing that I'd like to share with you, this is a citizen science project that we use at Ocean Connectors. It's the Whale Alert app. And this is how we track where whales are just during the sightings. So when we do our eco tours and we do whale watching tours, which is marine biologist led, it's an educational tour. We're tracking every time we see the whales, what we're seeing, where they're going, what direction, that type of thing. We also do it with our students. We take our students out on the water and we track where the whales are. This is, a, this is an initiative that is going on globally and it's helping fishermen, boaters, citizens um, see where the whales are at at what time so that we can navigate um, uh, accordingly, um, knowing that, okay, there are whales real close to the bay right now. Um, so it's wonderful to have that app and have it up on your phone. And if you have recreational um, activities going on your boat, it's really nice to share with the public. Okay, here's the app. Let's see where the whales have been in the last week or so, and then um, help track that as well. It's definitely a way to get people engaged, but it also helps them see that, oh, okay, there are whales in the area. That's why we're gonna be moving slower. That's why we're on the lookout, that type of thing. Um, so I highly encourage uh, everyone to, to jump on this app and then pull it up when you're on the water so that you can see where you're at. Um, we, like I said, we use this staff, students um, on our eco tours. Uh, we all utilize it and everybody has a wonderful time with it. And then here's the data. This is the data that we collected last season. Uh, the season is coming up starting December 15th, where the whales will be in our area. And so we'll start tracking again. And we also, the Port of San Diego has linked to our website where we show this tracking. And they're actually using this information uh, to inform their policy as far as um, speeds that boats are allowed to go at what times um, and what boats are allowed to, to come and go and, and from where. And so that's why tracking this and having as many data points is um, extremely important. Um, so it's nice to have that, that collaboration and really being able to do something with the information. Um, so how do we see ourselves actively engaging? You know, is this a recreational thing? Is this something that we can implement on our boats when we're out on the water? Um, I would like to stop there 
and I wasn't <laughs> Wasn't able to see everybody's faces as I was going through that because my multiple screen issue, but I did want to open it up to questions. I know that was um, a lot of high level overview of what's going on and I'd love to answer any, any questions that you all might have about this. Thank you, Janaira. I also included in um, the chat, we work with uh, Janaira and other people who um, are doing a lot of the well, you know, monitoring, et cetera. And we included in our newsletter that we produce with the Bay Foundation and the San Francisco Story Partnership, the link right there, we had an article with important apps for everybody to have handy. So of course that app that is so important is included there. And I'm going to let Eric Spross uh, unmute himself and ask the question. Welcome, Eric. Hi, thanks uh, for the presentation. And um, seeing whales from our boat has been one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. So this is a, a good topic. Mm -hmm. um, just a question about the sonar. We have a sonar on our boat. Most uh, recreational boaters do. Mm -hmm relatively small, relatively um, low resolution sonar. This, the Navy obviously has very, very powerful sonar. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what the regulations or technology is on commercial ships. Um, given that I am a boater and know a bunch of other boaters and I could turn my uh, device off when I'm offshore, for example, I don't need to check the depth out there. Uh, do you know if there's any real information about how much power comes out of our sonar and whether recreational boats, fishing boats, or Navy or commercial are the, the really um, most significant sector? Yeah, that is a great question. And, and forgive me because I was writing it down as you were asking. I will get with our staff marine biologist and see if I can get because I have an idea of what the answer is, but I want to make sure that I get you very accurate information on there. Um, as from what I understand it right now, it's not regulated um, recreationally and it isn't as much of a problem in the eyes of the lawmakers and things like that. Um, but I will definitely get with our marine biologist as well as the specialist at the port that we're working with to see if I can get you some, some real data on that. Super, thank you. Fantastic, and I just responded a, a question that was posted in the chat about like distance. Um, I included a link that we have in our Boating Clean and Green program about sharing the road with mammals that we put together with NOAA and other organizations. So that information is right there. I'm going to now let Lisa ask the question and uh, we can move on. Lisa, please. Thanks. And thank you so much for your lecture, Janira. Um, I haven't heard that whales can't hear or feel the boat that's coming straight toward them. And I'm wondering like, where does that information come from? Or is, are there studies that I can look at or article yeah, it's called the null hull effect, and it's not every single boat. So it depends on how, I mean, it depends on, on the physics and, and the way that it's, um, you know, the way that the water's moving through. So it's not every single boat, um, but I can get some of that information to you as well. Um, yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, I'd love to, to read that. Yeah, of course. Okay, I don't see more questions. Um, I'm just checking all the cameras here. I know Georgia and Natasha are also helping me here. So Janera, thank you so much for your time. Amazing information. We will keep pushing our channels, your great work and the app. And thank you for bringing to this table the magnificent mammals here, marine mammals that whales are. So thank you so much. And oh, I, uh, oh, Tom just was clapping. I thought he had a question. Sorry. All right. So we're switching gears here again. We're full of information and I'm very excited. And thank you again, Janaria, for joining us. Uh, just to switch a little bit to other topic, which is about boat sewage. 
doesn't sound like beautiful as the whale, but it's so important because of course, whales can be impacted by that. That's for sure. And I'm going to be uh, welcoming uh, a great uh, team um, that I have the pleasure to work with and in some capacity, not only partner, but supervise. And we have Liz Juvera with the San Francisco Estuary Partnership and Kendall Soriano with the Bay Foundation, who are going to be talking about uh, uh, why we monitor pump outs and how it impacts voters statewide, among others. So thank you and welcome, ladies. Thank you, Vivian, for that welcome and um, inviting us to present today. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kendall Soriano. I'm from the Bay Foundation, and I'm here with Liz Huvera um, from the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. And um, to start the conversation, get the ball rolling, we're going to have um, a couple questions to really test everyone's knowledge on boat sewage. So Vivian, if you could um, please launch that poll, that would be that would be wonderful. Great. And so I we just have... need and feel free to let me know once you want me to end the poll. Wonderful. Thank you, Vivian. So we have two questions for you here today. The first question reads, what does raw sewage do to our waterways when found in high concentrations? And the second reads, can you dump your untreated boat sewage within the three mile territorial limit? And we'll give about 20 seconds for you to answer. Great, it looks like we have some answers rolling in here. Okay, wonderful. That was about 20 seconds. Um, so hopefully everyone got a chance to answer. Uh, Vivian, if you could please close the poll and we'll review our answers. Wonderful. All right, so for the first question uh, that reads, uh, what does raw sewage do to our waterways when found in high concentrations? The uh, correct answer, which it looks like most of you got at a 97%, um, is all of the above. And for the second question, uh, can you dump your untreated boat sewage within three mile territorial limit? Um, it looks like everyone was right on the mark with this one as well. The answer is is no, it's, um, it's illegal to dump uh, your boat sewage within that three mile limit. So these answers are really a wonderful segue into our presentation today in which you will learn about our team's work together on a program called the Clean Vessel Act Grant in partnership with the California State Parks Division of Boating Waterways and the Coastal Commission. And really the goal of our program is to prevent boat sewage pollution throughout the entire state of California. And if Liz, if you could um, go to the next slide for me, please, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you, Kendall. I just wanted to hop in here and say hello as well. I'm Liz Huvera. And as you can see on the map that we're showing on the screen, um, this shows our different planning areas between our Clean Vessel Act grant programs here in California. So for both Northern and Southern California teams. And I work with the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. So we're based out of San Francisco and it is a national estuary program that was created to help protect and restore the San Francisco Bay Delta Estuary. Yeah, and similarly, the Bay Foundation, we're based in uh, Los Angeles. We're a part of the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency's National Estuary Program. Uh, and we work to restore the Santa Monica Bay and its watershed. And really with California's 1100 miles of coast um, and 4 million boaters, there's severe damage, damage demands placed on our state's waters, um, making it, it really essential to protect our water quality. And the primary goal of our programs and our work with the California State Division of Boating and Waterways um, is really to educate California boaters on the impacts of sewage, which ultimately you know, raises awareness and influences behavior and improves California's water quality altogether. So exactly what does our CVA grant program do? Um, San Francisco Estuary Partnership and the Bay Foundation are both national estuary programs designated by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, we're tasked with restoring, protecting um, estuaries of national significance. So we've partnered with DBW for over 15 years with a joint mission to protect, enhance, and restore our, the waters in our respective regions. And as a team, we form strong relationships with uh, vendors, in the boating industry, the boating public, marinas, yacht clubs, and other organizations throughout the state um, through really two uh, overarching statewide points of action. The first is sewage pump out monitoring, and the second is education outreach. 
So as a team, we conduct monitoring uh, visits of pump out units three times a year. We at the Bay Foundation, um, with help from our partners at Morro Bay National Estuary Program, monitor 72 pump out units in Southern California and um, SFEP monitors 82 pump outs in Northern California. So essentially pump out units are a machine used by boaters to safely dispose of their boat sewage. And our job is to go out three times a year and report on the functionality to ensure that boaters have a um, reliable way for them to uh, dispose of their sewage that's free of any uh, leaks. We basically go out and we're looking for them to be well-maintained with a functioning motor, a hose, sight glass, nozzle, ball valve, and any um, relevant signage displayed as well. And after every monitoring session, we produce status reports about these units, units which uh, Liz will uh, discuss in a few minutes. Um, and as partners to DBW, we provide our services through maintenance, education, partnership building, and technical assistance rather than enforcement. So we build trust with our marina partners by keeping in contact with them uh, before, during, and after our monitoring uh, units, monitoring sessions. Um, we provide them with parts and signage as needed and we help distribute grant application resources. And the second major component of our CBA program work is to promote public awareness about boat sewage and its proper disposal. So in order to do that, we develop a bunch of educational outreach materials and tools that are intended for recreational boaters and marina operators. And we take on opportunities to communicate with those audiences. And you can see here specific outreach materials that we distribute kind of look like regional guides um, for pump outs and recreational opportunities that are made in both English and Spanish, as well as videos, social media posts, and as Vivian referenced earlier, our new podcast, Dockside. And we also have quarterly articles that we publish um, on in voter publications, such as DBW's The Changing Tide, as well as the log and more. And we also create what Kendall referenced earlier, the California Annual Pump Out Report. And I'm gonna discuss that in detail in just a few minutes. But some of the opportunities for outreach and personal interaction with voters and waterfront operators include uh, the regional and national conferences we attend, such as the Marine Recreation Association and the state's organization for boating access. And as Kendall mentioned, we also engage folks in the field when we're monitoring pump outs. We also distribute surveys to learn more about voter sewage disposal habits, and we improve our program offerings based on those results. Uh, and of course, we hold boating events virtually, like today, or in person at yacht clubs and marinas on request. So please let us know if you'd like us to speak at your facility. Another flagship outreach tool that we want to promote um, and that we support is the Pump Out Nav app, which was created by California, our teams, um, to help boaters find pump outs, dump stations, and floating restrooms on the go. And so this app displays information on regulations, how to's, a bunch of grant information for marina operators, but there's also the ability for users, boaters, to report problems with units and personalize their accounts when they're in the field. And this year we've expanded to more states. So this is a nationwide product now. And so we've got California, Rhode Island, Washington, Oregon, a few other states coming on board soon. Um, and so this is a really exciting effort that has expanded from California. And we've also enabled the display of no discharge zones on the app in Washington and California. And we use this app to record the findings of those triannual surveys that Kendall, Kendall mentioned. <laughs> And now I'd like to take a little bit of a deeper dive into that resource that we mentioned earlier, which is called the Annual Dump and Pump Out Station Report, which we affectionately dub the ADPER. <laughs> so this report, as you can see here, uh, is a document that we create. It is a snapshot summary of the triannual machine testing that our teams conduct each year. And as Kendall said earlier, we visit publicly accessible pump outs throughout the San Francisco Bay and Delta, as well as Monterey and Southern California, three times per year to record the condition and performance of each unit. And this information is then distilled into this resource for boaters, marina managers, and other interested partners to see. So the 2021 version that we just updated was to include um, up dump stations and it was our first year monitoring those in the field so we wanted to incorporate those into the reporting as well 
And the goals of the ADPER are really to increase awareness of DBW's statewide pump out and dump station monitoring program, as well as to understand the likelihood that a voter, while they're out for the day, is going to have a positive experience at a specific unit and they can address issues where they come up. We also want to be able to have this serve as a tool to help understand pump out systems and why they're important to water quality and public health efforts. And the report itself as an overview, um, it's generated by our annual triannual or our triannual monitoring results as said before, <clears throat> we generate performance scores as a result of those triannual monitoring efforts. So each unit that we survey gets a usability score between zero and 100 each time we go out in the field. And those individual scores are averaged for the year and they're compiled and published. And here you can see um, an example of one of the scoring pages for Santa Barbara Harbor and each of the units that they've got there. So the scores themselves are calculated by reviewing the condition and performance of the unit. And so this means, as Kendall said, we examine the parts such as ball valves and sight glasses, appropriate wayfinding and signage, and we also test how the unit performs. So that requires us testing the vacuum pressure of the machine and testing how quickly it can empty a five gallon bucket. So while we're in the field, we also help marina managers by providing replacement pieces if necessary. We carry with us nozzle tips, meters, and other small parts that tend to break really easily, and this can help them to improve their score the next time we go out to survey. Here you can see just the maintenance recommendations page in the report where we recommend um, and show examples of parts in both good and bad condition. This is a visual tool that we, we've seen how it kind of helps guide marina operators in keeping up their machines. And in addition to the previous coverage, the report also has in including a bunch of other educational details, such as you know, the specific types of pump outs, including peristaltic, diaphragm, or vacuum, if any of you use a pump out semi-often. <laughs> so we've got those included. We also have plenty of information about the pump out nav app that I referenced, and also the methodology that we use when we go out to monitor. We also include um, details on each publicly accessible pump out and dump station that are within those monitoring regions that we go out to. And so for the report takeaways, there's a few that I'd like you all to go away with. This is a really useful report um, and the work done annually by our teams in general um, with this resource can be used by California state government and various organizations to review areas where usability may have declined over time and we can focus resources toward those areas. This report also serves as an asset for marina managers and operators to guide their facility updates and see a yearly track record of their units. And I've been recently getting a lot of requests from marina managers while out in the field to see how their machine is doing and they want to see themselves published, so it's exciting. And lastly, um, voters and birthers can use the report results as an influence for marina management to improve conditions, um, which will in turn attract more environmentally savvy and responsible voters to their facility. And so I'm now going to go ahead and hand it back to Kendall. She's gonna take us through another key report that our teams generated this year. Yeah, thanks Liz. Um, so between October, 2020 and February, 2021, the California Boating Clean and Green Program San Francisco Estuary Partnership and the Bay Foundation um, implemented this statewide survey uh, called the Boater Sewage Disposal Survey Report. And the, the big goal of this survey was to really understand how boaters do or do not utilize sewage disposal services. The survey findings were analyzed uh, to summarize recreational boaters' preferred sewage disposal methods to gain insight on how their needs are currently being met and um, also in turn to educate our outreach efforts and, um, and help protect California's waterways. So for 112 days, project partners digitally surveyed California boaters um, by referencing the California Vessel Waste Disposal Plan and the state's registered vessels and slip totals, a sample size was established um, based on a 5% margin of error. And the goal was to reach about 400 total boat, survey, boat um, participants. So displayed here are a few examples uh, asked in this uh, survey. 
And due to COVID-19, um, there were some restrictions placed and, and partners used both virtual as well as socially distanced in-person uh, outreach strategies to solic solicit participants. So exactly who was our audience for this survey? In total, we received 424 responses and um, we were able to divide them into specific voter uh, groups based on this one question, what type of head is on your boat? And um, basing uh, the answers uh, that we received from this question, we were able to divide them into four different groups. Uh, the first were consisting of respondents with a marine sanitation device on board uh, and a holding tank that could be pumped out. And as you can see, this was the majority of our survey respondents at about 75%. The second group were respondents with a porta potty on board, a marine composting toilet, or simply a bucket. Uh, the third voter group were respondents with a flow uh, through marine sanitation device on board, but didn't have a holding tank. And the last voter group were respondents with uh, no head on board at all. And so because of our time, Together, uh, I would focus on uh, just group one, which is voters with a holding tank that can be pumped out. So next, we wanted to understand our audience's uh, go-to disposal method and how they how satisfied they are with it. In response to the question, how do you dispose of boat sewage? Uh, more than half at 60% of voter group one indicated they use stationary sewage pump outs, followed by what you see here, uh, mobile, bump, mobile pump out boats, and then um, discharging overboard. From here, we asked respondents uh, how satisfied they were with their usual disposal method. They were directed to select a number from zero to five, uh, zero being very unsatisfied and five being uh, very satisfied. And we discovered that stationary sewage pump out users had an average satisfaction rate of about 3.7 out of five. Respondents said that this rating could be improved uh, by increased accessibility, uh, better functionality, improved cleanliness, and lower price. So knowing that users weren't extremely satisfied with their routine disposal method, uh, we wanted to know if all ways to service your boat were entirely free, uh, what would you as a boater choose? So within Boater Group 1, um, the respondents indicated that they'd firstly choose an option of mobile pump out, um, followed by an in-slip sewage pump out, and then followed lastly um, by stationary sewage pump outs. So as a follow-up to these individuals, they were asked, would you be willing to pay more if your marina or yacht club had your ideal service uh, method? And there was about an even split uh, in responses to this. 45% uh, indicated yes, that they would pay more and uh, 44 responded that no, they wouldn't pay more. So in addition to understanding uh, recreational boaters' ideal disposal method and their satisfaction rates, we really wanted to understand their perceived benefits of not discharging sewage overboard. This was an open-ended question. Um, and as you can see for both voter group one displayed on the left and voter group two displayed on the right, the most common answer was water quality, which is great. It's important. Um, it indicates a connection that voters find between um, the health of the flora and fauna of our waterways. And so lastly, we wanted to understand how these respondents find information about sewage pump outs or dump stations when they're in an unfamiliar area. So for both boaters with a head um, and a holding tank and those with a porta potty bucket or composting toilet, the primary source was asking marina staff. And so our key takeaways um, from this survey are a lot. And, and we firstly uh, encourage you to review the full report um, and uh, to review the recommendations and our takeaways. Um, but to summarize, um, focusing on just voter group one of the survey respondents who have a holding tank, 60% indicated stationary sewage pump outs um, are their go-to method. Yet the average satisfaction rate for this method is only in about 3.7 out of five. So data reveals that this rating could be improved by increased accessibility followed by functionality, better functionality. Also, it's worth noting that voters with holding tanks chose uh, mobile pump out services as their second go-to way of disposing their sewage, but it's their primary method in an ideal world if all methods were free. Additionally, the third most common way to dispose of sewage for voters with holding tanks on board 
was uh, discharging overboard. Despite this only accounting for about 12% uh, of our respondents, the environmental and public health impacts of overboard sewage are severe. So um, continuing education and outreach efforts are, are really vital to raise awareness not to dump overboard. So across all voter groups, there's really three main takeaways that informed uh, the Bay Foundation, San Francisco Estuary Partnership, and DBW's work and, um, and marketing. So the first is that water quality is a shared perceived benefit to not dumping overboard. Marinas serve as spokespeople for stewardship and resources um, and have a big influence on the boating community. And lastly, community interaction really informs behavior and potentially sparks behavior change. And so that um, really wraps up our presentation today. Thank you all for listening and sharing your time. Um, please feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Please unmute. Um, and Liz and I would love to address any questions you have. And um, again, big thank you to California State Parks Division of Boating Waterways and the U.S. Um, Fish and Wildlife Sport Fishing Restoration Program for having us here and Vivian for hosting us as well. Thank you, Kendall and Liz. Great, great uh, presentation um, on the importance of you know, getting educated about the proper ways to proper dispose of our sewage. Um, it, you're getting a thank you in the chat, which is fantastic. And, and I want to give the opportunity for people to ask questions. Again, I just drop in the chat the links to the reports in the follow-up email. We will include also those reports as well. Uh, and I see John, you had a question, I think. Go ahead, John. Yeah, uh, thanks, Vivian. Uh, Liz, Kendall, uh, great um, presentation and appreciate all the, all the details. Um, as the Coast Guard Auxiliary being in and around a, a lot of the marinas, uh, just curious as, as to, um, you, you know, getting the word out. Uh, do you guys participate in the National Safe Boating Week at all, like at any of the marinas? We, I believe we have in the past, um, sometimes we'll participate with, under uh, a Viv Vivian's program, um, but definitely something that, that we can look into. Yeah, yeah yes. John, I can, I can tell you that um, uh, the Bay Foundation is our main partner for the Doc Walker program in Southern okay. California. So, uh, and as you remember, uh, you guys are our main partners in that effort in one of our main uh, topics about best management practices that we cover in the Doc Walker program is actually sewage via our boater kits, etc. So they do a fantastic job in Southern California. They are the experts down there in terms of going to yacht clubs, boat shows, boating events when we are allowed and, you know, give the presentation, even virtual, just to, um, you know, spread the word out. So they do a lot of the uh, multifaceted outreach approach down there. Okay. But the more, the better. Yeah, yeah, great, and and certainly want to put you on on the invite list and and at least make all of our Coast Guard auxiliaries smart about this since they're you know kind of uh, you know on the front lines with that. So uh, thanks for the great information. I'll yeah. reach out. Thank you. That's wonderful. And yeah, just like Vivian said, um, we really encourage uh, anyone that's in the boating community to join the Dock Walker program. Um, it's a great way to get out and really get the word. Um, out about how to prevent uh, boat sewage pollution from our waters. So thanks, John. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And actually, the Coast Guard Auxiliary is one of our main partners for the Dock Walker program since the year 2000 because it supports the um, active Coast Guard, of course, environmental protection. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Oh, I see Eric now. He just raised his hand. So go ahead, Eric, please. Uh, hi, uh, just a question uh, that's... Uh, ambiguous to me what are the what is the incentive for a marina to have a pump out station that's a really good question we're actually doing a study on that currently um, but often we see that a lot of boaters are attracted to a facility that has great operating pump out facilities and so that would be the incentive usually if you are Coming to a marina for that purpose, it is likely that you care about the environment and doing the right thing about disposing sewage properly. And so you are either going to get more business as a result of folks coming to use your pump out and then secondarily going to use your bait and tackle shop or coming in to purchase additional supplies. So currently we are doing a study. We'll be able to publish some findings from that later this year. 
but uh, we'll, we'll give you better insights soon. <laughs> Yeah, Thank one you. more thing I, I, that I wanted to to mention, in addition to the great uh, response from Liz, the fact that um, voters want to be at a facility that provides the most convenient services for them. And of course, if you're a voter, you want to keep your boat in a marina where you know that these charges do not occur because they will impact your your a boat and also because boaters are good stewards of the environment and they they want just to make sure that the water our waterways are clean and green for future generations and they are always trying just to look for facilities that are clean and green and in a way that's why the industry started the clean marinas program because they thought hmm, you know we can do much better be above the state and federal regulations and implement best management practices. And the best way to do that is to provide the proper services in terms of pollution prevention to the boating uh, community. I have two more questions and I know everybody's super excited. I just don't want to steal too much time. We have one more pre uh, uh, presentation, but I want just to let uh, Tom and Curtis ask questions and, and Tom, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and then Curtis. <clears throat> Yes, thank you, Vivian. Uh, I was just curious if you guys could quickly shine a light on some of the biggest challenges that you face when you're trying to set up pump outs. Um, so I think we're hearing about their functionality once they're there, but in like, what are some of the the obstacles to getting them to getting them in place? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. You want to go for that, Liz? No, Georgia, go for it. Oh, I mean, I would. I feel like it's a good question for marina facility stakeholders themselves and also potentially DBW. Um, I know from the grant side, it's often that the marina managers and dock masters are so busy that to fill out a grant application can be kind of cumbersome to get the infrastructure installed and then meet the reimbursement. Um, but if we have any other marina managers here who want to speak on their side. It's a really good question. Yeah, we have in the in the um, chat Alicia Kunz, who is a very active and amazing marine operator down in the beautiful Marina del Rey. Um, she is um, actually mentioning pump out incentive for marinas. I manage a marina that installed a new public pump out eight years ago. I always get questions from prospective voters about this. This is a great additional amenity. So she was um, kind of answering the previous question. And for Tom, uh, being with the uh, California State Parks and being the, the one of the managers for the CBA program, uh, based on what we know, sometimes uh, Marinas feel like, yes, as, as Georgia mentioned, the application is a little bit cumbersome and we are a work in progress. So we're always looking for ways to improve that. Uh, the application could be could look as scary, but once you are done, you're like, oh, that was it. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. So we're uh, trying to find actually ways to make it simpler and more straightforward for the marinas to take advantage of that money and being able to install bomb pads wherever it's applicable to. So a lot to learn too. <laughs> thank uh, you, Curtis. Great, great stuff. Thank you, Tom, and thank you for your help and support, Curtis. Welcome. Good to see Hi. you. My name is Curtis Howell, and I serve as the harbor master for Clipper Yacht Harbor up in Sausalito. And I didn't have a question as much as a response to uh, Mr. Spross and Mr. Ford. And it's actually I'll second what Vivian and Alicia said, which is our tenants teams they tend to be a pretty informed bunch, and they view having a pump out the pump out convenience as a great um, amenity. Uh, we actually, a part of, a portion of our marina has pump outs at every other slip, which is great. And then we provide free pump outs to our tenants uh, at our fuel dock. Um, the other, and as far as obstacles go, I'd say it's infrastructure. You know, that, that capital investment improvement is, if you're doing work on the docks, then it's a perfect time to, to put in the system. Um, Otherwise, it's a lot of retrofitting and a lot of a lot of effort. Um, but I, you know, I would fall on the side of what Alicia said. It's the tenants really appreciate it because it folks who are voting want to want to take care of the environment. So that's my two cents. Thanks. <laughs> Alicia is giving you the thumbs up here. Thank you so much, and Natasha. Um, uh, Don uh, or Daniels with um, the San Francisco Story Partnership. She monitors uh, Curtis as part of the monitoring that they just reported. And she's saying that um, the pump out at that marina is extremely uh, fast, and um, you know people really like that a lot. A lot. 
Yay. All right. So we're switching gears to another world. Um, and this is my time. I'm just like going to be uh, presenting right now. And before we move there, I want to express my gratitude again to the great team with the Bay Foundation and SFEP uh, for the work they do. Um, so we're moving into the last item of the agenda, uh, which is going to be a a presentation that I'll be doing with uh, Jalin Lee with the California Product Stewardship Council and Christian Centeno with the Port of LA, which is about expired uh, marine flares in California. So first of all, I will start from a bird's eye view perspective because I know a lot of you are not very familiar for about what's going on here and why we need to even talk about this, right? So we're going to talk about what uh, are marine flares, what type of boaters need to comply with this requirement, uh, what they are, why they are considered hazardous waste and why this is an issue in California. And then what California is doing in terms of offering collection events. But before I do that, um, I want to include a quick poll here, and I'm going just to launch it here um, to see if you guys can please read it and share with us your knowledge. Do all type of boats are required to carry onboard marine flares? Um, so I'll give you um, a few more seconds just to see if um, you know, again, Everything is about learning. That's why we put together these educational meetings. And I put at the, at the end, I don't know, but I want to learn because we should be learning every day something new. And we're here just to, to do that about this particular topic. So I'll give you a couple of more seconds here. And it seems that everybody uh, responded. So I'm going to end the poll here. And, the, and share the results. And as you can see here, uh, almost 60% of all of you said, no, not all the boats required to carry onboard uh, marine flares. Uh, almost 40% said yes. And some people said, or 4% said, hey, I don't know, but I want to learn. So that's why we're here. All right, so um, let's move on here. So uh, marine flares are a type of pyrotechnic device that produces either a brilliant light or a plume of colorful smoke as a visual distress signal to attract attention in case of an emergency. For example, to help to pinpoint the boater's exact location. And there are two most common types. One is the handheld flare, the other one is aerial flares. All the flares need to be uh, manufactured following the Coast Guard specifications uh, to be approved visual distress signals. So uh, what type of boats uh, are required to comply with having them on board? Uh, the, the US Coast Guard requires that vessels uh, longer than 16 feet in length operating in coastal waters, the Great Lakes, territorial seas and waters connected uh, directly to them are required to carry them on board. But like always in life, there are exceptions to the rules. And the exceptions are recreational uh, boats that are less than 16 feet in length, open sail boats less than 26 feet in length and not equipped with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, propulsion machinery and manually propelled boats. In that case, those vessels are only required to carry nighttime distress signals when operating from sunset to sunrise. The Coast Guard requires boaters to carry a minimum of three daytime and three nighttime uh, flares to meet the uh, requirements, <clears throat> or only uh, three pyrotechnic flares that are approved for both daytime and nighttime use. So for example, the red color handheld and aerial pyrotechnic flares are approved for both daytime and nighttime use, and the orange color flares are approved uh, for daytime uh, only uh, use. Based on federal regulations, uh, the, uh, um, the expiration date of the flares uh, is between 36 to 42 months from the manufacture date. And as you can see in the bottom picture, uh, boaters can simply check that expiration date directly into the pyrotechnic uh, flares. And it is important that the people who are required, or boaters who are required to carry them on board, they need to be in serviceable condition, make sure that they are not expired because failure to have distress signals with those conditions 
um, can result in a fine of $1,100. And it is important to know that the Coast Guard may inspect boaters on a random uh, basis. So why their hazardous waste? So it turns out that for the Department of Toxic Substances Control and the EPA, uh, those flares that are no longer uh, used for their intended purpose are considered hazardous waste because they are uh, toxic, reactive, and initiable. And as you can see at the bottom of this slide, uh, pyrotechnic flares contain <clears throat> Uh, metals and pollutants that can impact water and human health. Um, uh, for example, they are uh, recognized by the EPA and the Toxic Substances Control Act inventory list. And they also get, can, for example, perchlorate uh, impair the thyroid uh, function. There are a bunch of studies about that. So why marine expire flares are an issue in our state? It turns out that uh, expired marine flares, again, are hazardous ways, need to be transported and properly disposed as a hazardous, in a hazardous ways facility permitted by the EPA to manage explosives. It turns out that at a national level, there are only three facilities across the nation, again, which are two facilities that uh, treat in incinerators in Utah and Louisiana, and one that uh, treats on open burning, which is in Missouri, not in California. Currently, California doesn't have any permitted facilities because, as you can imagine, treating those is pretty tricky, uh, and it creates a lot of uh, uh, toxics, and uh, the state is pretty uh, strict about that. So, of course, collecting them, packing them, and shipping them, and then disposing of the flares can cost between $7 to $50 per flare. So it's a very, very expensive uh, process to uh, have. Um, so a few years back, actually 10 years ago, uh, talking to boaters, other state agencies, Coast Guard Auxiliary, Power Squadrons, among others, it was brought to our attention that it was becoming an issue in California because in the past, some of the Coast Guard Auxiliary or Power Squadrons were, or the fire stations or the police department were accepting them to you know, do some exercises. But of course they were getting overwhelmed because at the end they didn't know, okay, what are we supposed to, pro to do to properly dispose of that? So we created a working group uh, led by the two agencies that I represent, the Department of Toxic Substances Control, Cal Recycle, and other local municipalities, including the San Francisco Department of Environment and also the Governor's Office of Emergency Services and Cal Recycle. And we conducted a lot of a study, actually even a national survey, and we identified that California wasn't alone or is still not alone trying to tackle this issue. As a result of this working group, many things happen. Uh, first of all, Cal Recycle, which is one of our sister state agencies, decided to create a grant, as you can see in this screen, where municipalities can apply to get money to properly and legally uh, offer temporary collection events. That was a very good uh, first step because again, throughout the nation that is not happening. In addition to that, <clears throat> Uh, we created a fact sheet that I'll be sharing with you uh, later on in the chat. I forgot to copy the link and I'll do that once I'm done presenting, uh, which tried to educate the boating community about what's going on. And in addition to that, um, uh, the industry uh, started creating uh, other uh, flares uh, that are actually um, Coast Guard approved electronic visual distress signals to be able to transition from the traditional flares. And I'll be talking about that in a few seconds. So what I want to say is it is a national problem, but California, again, is a stepping up and trying just to come up with decisions. And actually, the rest of the nation is looking at us like what we're doing. So what are some of the recommendations we have right now to be able to tackle this problem? We don't have a statewide program to collect constantly the flares because again, it's very expensive to do that. So if in your location, uh, there's not a temporary collection event, please contact the California Department Toxic Substances Control because they, they could help you guiding you in, in terms of this issue. Do not discharge expired marine flares during civic fireworks uh, festivities or events. Actually, it is important because a lot of people, and we see that in 
a lot of social media that they said, oh, 4th of July is here, Veterans Day is here, just go on, you know, utilize your flares. And firing a flare in a non-emergency is considered a false distress message and actually is a federal crime. Is a D felony. And just to share with all of you, just having my regulations in front of me, that could be subject to six years in federal prison or up to $250,000 in fine. So it is not. Plus, you can deviate the attention of the responders. And that happens a couple of times across this, uh, the nation where the Coast Guard, instead of really responding to something that was real, they got deviated their attention and it was a false alarm. We also encourage, again, your county to conduct a collection event for recreational voters. Please, CalRecycle offers the, the grants, and if we don't use that money, we lose it. So it is important that the, the different counties apply for that money just to do that temporary a collection event. And I mentioned already that also there are a, a Coast Guard approved electronic visual distress signals that voters can start utilizing, which are a great solution. I'm showing in this next slide uh, some of the companies uh, that are selling uh, these uh, flares. And they, first of all, fantastically, because the uh, industry did a great job. They don't release chemicals. They don't expire. They are safe to use. They are uh, easy to operate. And in addition to that, in some cases, they are visible up to 10 nautical miles. So it's a great uh, a new resource for boaters uh, uh, to transition. So I mentioned to you that the state, yes, doesn't have a perfect solution, but we are extremely ahead of the game because California was the first state that started implementing fully legal collection events. So that's what we want to share with you now. Back in 2019, uh, three Bay Area uh, counties uh, step up, receive money from calorie recycle and run the first uh, collection events that were fully uh, and legally permitted. I, I'm not going to read all the numbers, but as you can see here, there were a great uh, participation. Uh, uh, thousands of flares were collected. And actually, for example, as Jalene will mention later on, Alameda County continues to do that on an annual basis because they know there's a need for these collection uh, events. So these are some of the uh, photos that we took at some of these events, tons of uh, flares here and there. And I'm going to stop now to let uh, Yalin uh, again with the California Product Stewardship Council to talk about some other uh, most recent events that have happened thanks to uh, her organization applying to the grants. And then we will switch to uh, Christian who will talk about the Port of LA uh, that also conducted one uh, right now. So Yalin is all yours. All right, thank you for the introduction, Vivian. Let me share my screen. Let's see. Okay, that's good. All right, so I'm just going to do a brief introduction of CPSC. Um, so we are the California Product Stewardship Council, and we're a nonprofit based out of Sacramento, but we do work all over the state of California. And as you can see here on the board, we have a lot of influential people who are, um, help as well as people who fund us, including cities and counties all over California. A little bit more about our board. And so, yeah, so just a brief overview. So last year is kind of the first year CPSC started working on these collection events. And so we did a joint collection event um, with Alameda County and Delta Diablo in partnership with Cal Recycle and the California State Parts and the Coastal Commission, as Vivian was talking about. And so, um, so these are just some of the numbers. I kind of forgot to put the numbers up at the totals that we got, but Vivian will give you a little bit of overview of the past numbers. And so I wanted to also just talk about why these are uh, these long-term collection events is not like an ultimate solution because it is very costly. And one of the big reasons why is because of disposal and the travel. And so there's only three facilities uh, in the country um, that do it. So there's one in Utah, one in Utah, and one in Missouri. Um, and the trucks that since these are hazardous and explosive materials, the trucks that transport these players have to have a DOT permit. And we usually go through clean harbors because they have DOT certified. Um, that's so you can see for um, Alameda, um, just for the packaging, transportation, disposal alone for these sole events is about $26,000, but they pay out of pocket every single year. And they managed to split that cost. So it was a little bit lower to about 13,000 when they split that cost with Delta Diablo. 
And because Alameda has had these consistent events, um, they they actually pack the truck a little bit more. And so it only costs about twelve dollars to dispose of one flare. However, Jesse Diablo costs about fifty dollars to dispose of one flare because it's the first year they at that event, and they are a little bit more inland, and so they don't have as many um, boaters that actually require more flares on their boats at all times. Um, so this year we hosted um, multiple events, and so we hosted one in Del Norte County and Humboldt County just this last weekend, also in Alameda County, East Contra Costa County, and West Contra Costa County. And just to give you some numbers, we're really happy with the numbers that we got this year. So in Del Norte, we actually had 38 participants that showed up, and they just we disposed about 449 flares. We haven't gotten the exact numbers yet from Clean Harbors, but we're really excited about this being the first event that this happened. And they also shared it with Humboldt County, just open it up and give a farther reach. Um, so these are really great numbers for our first event. Um, so Alameda also took uh, 19 boats, boaters that came, including the Sheriff Bomb Squad, and they collected about oh, just over 1,000 individual flares to be a little bit over 370 pounds of flares. Uh, much Contra Costa, uh, they had their flares a little bit differently. They actually opened, the, um, they used the magazine box to collect the flares for a um, multi-day event for over the month, starting October 5th to October, November 5th. And so over that time, they had about 23 people that came and dropped off flares over the course of this month. And it accounted for just a little bit under 500, uh, a little bit over 500 flares and a little bit under 500 pounds of flares. And they filled about 16 um, five gallon buckets of flares. So just for the first um, year doing this, um, we're really happy with the results. We're still waiting on the results from East Contra Costa, but this year we're really happy with all the results that came, all the voters that showed up. We did a lot of advertisement and a lot of special thanks to Vivian for all the work that she did to outreach these events as well. And so we're really seeing that all across California, there is a need with all of these voters dropping off their flares at all across the county. And so as we've been talking about earlier, at these events, we also try to um, as voters drop off their um, non-reusable single-use partner flares, we also give them the reusable alternatives. And so we partner with Serious Signal in order to give out these events, uh, these events to give out these flares. So just a little video so you can see how these flares work at night. This is a video provided to us by Serious Signal. So you can see um, they give out just as much as the single-use flares and they you can keep them on like forever. Um, so unlike the single-use flares where you shoot off and someone misses it, they miss it. Um, you can keep these flares on constantly until you receive help, which is a very good benefit of these flares. And they're also battery operated and they float, so you actually drop it over the water and you just pick it right back up. And so just to talk about, um, we also wanted to wrote our um, Marine Fire webpage for the end of it, CPSC is an education-based nonprofit. And we want our mission is to create programs and create awareness of the challenges that we have with um, hard to manage products like marine flares. And so our main web page, we have um, a webinar that we recorded in the past, one with Vivian that we just did last month. So you can learn a little bit more about the marine flare issue, as well as collection events and coupons for the single, um, the reusable marine flares as well. And so if you're interested in also getting involved in the marine flare movement, uh, feel free to contact us at CPSC. We can talk about how to get free or discounted LEDs to hand out, um, how to um, do a collection event and all of that. And so if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, at yalin at calpsc.org, as well as info at calpsc.org if you're interested in joining one of our events. And I'll pass it off for Christian at the top of the Port of LA. Thank you, Yalin. I will share my screen in a moment. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Christian Centeno, and I am a environmental specialist with the Port of Los Angeles. And I'm here to continue the conversation of marine flares and discuss how the Port of Los Angeles has recognized its environmental impacts and how we developed the first marine flare collection event in Los Angeles County. Christian, you're not sharing the screen yet. Oh, I'm not, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Can you see that? Sorry, just to make sure that um, it's on the right screen. Yes, you are. You are in okay. the first one. Great. Let's move on. So here's a photo of the Port of Los Angeles. Oh, let me move this to the side. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, here's a photo of the Port of Los Angeles. The port is a department of the city of LA, and we're also known as the Harbor Department. We're located about 25 miles south of downtown Los Angeles in San Pedro Bay, just adjacent to the Port of, Los, Port of Long Beach. The Port of Los Angeles is the nation's gateway for international commerce and is the busiest seaport in North America. 
The Port of, port of LA is a border friendly environment. We host 15 recreational marinas in two areas of the port. There's one in, or there's four in San Pedro and the others in Wilmington, California. We offer public landing and courtesy recreational docks in the downtown harbor area where visiting boaters can dock their vessels and tourists can board harbor tours. The port also offers a free public boat launch adjacent to inner, um, inner Cabello Beach. With the nature of managing an industrial seaport, the Port of LA strives to maintain our environmental resources to improve and sustain our local habitat. To do, the, to do this, the Port of the Port of LA's Environmental Management, Management Division focuses on water, sediment, and air quality. Currently, the port's harbor waters is a 303D listed water body, and it's impaired for heavy metals, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, DDTs, and PCBs. In regards to air quality, the port strives to reduce vessel and vehicle emissions along with greenhouse gases through the Clean Air Action Plan. As this relates to marine flares, we are concerned with the improper disposal and illicit discharge of flares and how that might impact our water and air quality. As we heard from Vivian from the Coastal Commission, flares do contain strontium nitrate, sodium peroxide, potass and potassium perchlorate, among other contaminants. Because of these potential contaminants, the port has implemented programs and initiatives to reduce these types of pollutants from entering our harbors. One of our initiatives is the, is the Water Resource Action Plan, otherwise known as the RAP. The RAP is a co-initiative with the Port of Long Beach and in partnership with US EPA to reduce pollution in the port complex. One of the programs within the RAP is the Clean Marina Program. The Clean Marina Program was developed to educate marina owners and boaters on clean boating activities. Through the Clean Marina Program, we developed the Marine Fair Collection Event. Now let's go on to our first uh, marine, clear, uh, marine flare collection event. As we heard from Vivian, there are currently no disposal facilities of marine flares in California, making disposal of flares difficult. In response, in 2021, the Port of LA held the first marine flare collection event in Los Angeles County. The event offered free disposal of marine flares, which includes hand flares and aerial flares, and is available to all residents of LA County and for boaters who are birthed, who birthed their vessel within LA County's jurisdiction. Because this was the first marine fair collection event in Los Angeles County, there was no template or framework to work off of. Therefore, we had to learn the permitting process and understand and work through the logistical issues to hold the event. So I'll go through that now. So I'd like to go over some of the requirements for to hold the event. This may be helpful to other agencies who may be interested in hosting a similar, a similar type of event. The first hurdle is to understand logistics. Transportation of marine flares is very expensive. This is because marine flares are classified and placard as a hazard class 1.4 explosive by DOT. This classification requires explosives to be tested, classed, and marked with an EX number. An EX number identifies the waste as explosive, which then requires stringent packaging requirements. Due to testing and packaging requirements, transportation and disposal of the waste becomes prohibitively expensive. Fortunately, the US DOT has created a special permit, which is the DOT SP20599, which is, uh, let me bring out my cursor so I could show you, um, is this permit here. That permit exempts the regulation that requires the stringent classing and packaging requirements. The permit allows the hazardous waste to, be to not be tested and classed as a 1.4 explosive, but rather be classed as a 1.1 and 1.3. By classing it in these classifications, the generator saves thousands of dollars in shipping costs. To obtain the permit, the generator must submit an application to the US DOT to become a party of the permit. And this is what the Port of LA did. This allowed the Port of LA to afford the cost of holding the event. Once we obtained the special permit, we obtained a temporary EPID number through Cal DTSC. With that EPID number, we're, we filed a application for a temporary household hazardous waste collection facility with DTSC. We then submitted that form to our local COOPA. And for us, it was the Los, Los Angeles County Fire Department. And then from there, the Los Angeles County Fire Department or COOPA, they approved our event. After our event was approved, we notified local fire, police and hazardous materials teams in our area. Moving on to the next aspect of the flare event is the preparation. To prepare for the event, we performed an advertisement campaign by creating flyers, banners, distributing ads through social media platforms, 
uh, physically distributing the flyers and, place, and the placement of strategic newsletters, such as the log. We also received advertisement assistance from the California Coastal Commission who shared the event information for a larger audience. Secondly, we developed partnerships and incentives, partnerships and incentives with local businesses and government agencies to receive coupons for boating equipment to help attract participants to the event. We received coupons from West Marine for boating equipment and we received boater kit vouchers and e-flare coupons from the California State Parks. Lastly, we conducted a pre and post event survey to all participants to gather important information that could help us plan for future events. So this was a little bit of the preparation to hold the event. This is a lot of advertisement, um, getting those uh, partic uh, par partnerships with uh, local businesses and agencies, and then data gathering. Now let's go on to our event. Our first Marine Flare Collection event was held on July 19, 2021 at Cabrillo Way Marina in San Pedro, California. The event was initially a drive-through event, but we recognized that because we held the event at an actual marina, that we would have participants walk up to our, uh, our event. Therefore, we created a walk-up station for the participants to dispose of their waste um, on hand. During the event, we received a total of 52 participants and collected about 1,400 flares, which equates to about 500 pounds of flares. Based on the turnout, we showed that this service was warranted and wanted in the local marina communities, which led us to host our second event. Our second event was held this past September, just about two months ago at Newmore Yacht Centre Marina in Wilmington, California. During the planning of this event, we decided to move the event to Wilmington, California, to Wilmington uh, versus San Pedro, uh, because Wilmington is a more impoverished area and we want to include uh, the Wilmington side marina communities to the event. In this past event, we received about 64 participants, which was an increase of 50, from 52 in 2021. We collected about 1400 flares, which equates to 440 pounds of marine flares. We're gonna go into some comparisons from 2021 and 2022. So we received an increase of 23% particip participants in 2022 versus 2021. This was a promising metric because it showed that there are still many individuals who could benefit from this event. Although we did see a decrease of 5% of flares collected, which is about 11% decrease in poundage. While we received a decrease in total flares collected in 2022 versus 21, one of our surveys indicated that the average age of flares collected in 2022 was about 30 to 50 years old. So our, our flares are still quite um, old and they're being stockpiled out in the community. This is an inter interesting figure because it tells us that there's still aging, uh, aging flares out there. Based on the finding, we, we have determined that marine flare collection events remain a beneficial service to the local marine boaters and help the Port of LA protect our environmental resources through the prevention of improper disposal and illicit discharge of marine flares. So this concludes my presentation. I'll leave you all off with this. Um, if there's any boaters in the Los Angeles County area, we will be having a marine flare collection event annually. So every single year, usually in late summer, early fall. So I welcome all boaters in LA County to uh, participate in our events. And if you're outside of LA County, I recommend that you reach out to Vivian um, from the Coastal Commission to uh, locate one that's near your area. And I'll open the floor to questions. Thank you so much, Christian. So I was just reading that the chat in Alicia, we have been communicating with Alicia a lot about this uh, events. And yes, it's crazy to see how people come to these events and then out of the blue, there are flares from 1917. <laughs> You're like even like scared of you and getting closer to them because they tend to leach a lot of, you know, chemicals that are not good for anybody to be even uh, nearby. So um, I want just to open up uh, the floor to for, for people to ask any questions. Uh, Jim is asking, does the age of flares create a higher hazard? Yes, because they, um, Jim, the chemicals tend to become much more unstable. 
So it is not good. And as uh, we mentioned throughout the presentation, perchlorate and among other stuff is pretty crazy. Um, uh, Christian, would you mind stopping sharing your screen so we can um, uh, give the opportunity for people to ask questions? Um, and James is asking Christian if you can share with him in the chat uh, the email. And here we are with Jalene and Christian after this great group presentation um, open for any question people may have. Sure, I'll add my email in a few moments. Yeah, and also for all of you to know in the follow-up email, so you have everything in one place, you will find the email from all of the speakers, tons of links, so it's easier for you. It, it, John has a question. Go ahead, John. Yeah, uh, the, great presentation, everyone. And certainly, this is probably the 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 most asked question that that we get in the Coast Guard Auxiliary, whether we're you know putting on a a, a show at West Marine. Um, but certainly, it it boils down to this. And I I've even had the the local NOAA guy you know, call us up and say, hey, what do we do with flares? And I know, Vivian, we've talked, and I know that um, it's county by county, but what, until we get every county on board, what would prevent um, somebody from uh, going from Santa Cruz County to deliver uh, at the event, say, in, in Alameda County? Is, is it by driver's license, or what, what do we do? What should we tell those people? So let me just see if I'm answering. And of course, Jalene and Christian as being experts too, feel free to jump in whenever you need to. So what you're saying, John, is um, uh, how are the counties properly serving the voters of their county so they don't drive to the different location? That's pretty much what I'm reading. Yeah. yeah. So, so for example, you know, I, I, I have a person uh, approach me at, at, at the dock and they, and they say, look, I'm in Santa Cruz County and I understand there's a recycling event in Alameda. Can I drive up there and drop my stuff off? Or is it oh, by it. driver's license, home of record, or, you know, until we get our arms around this completely. Yeah. So <clears throat> Christian, I don't know if you want to respond. Right. Yeah, I could. So I can only give you an example of how the Port of Los Angeles handles um, that scenario. So here in the Port of LA, in our flyer, we show that um, we have a requirement that the participant must show an ID say, uh, showing that they are living within um, the, sorry, LA County, or they have a boater slip or an invoice from their marine, local marina that shows that their vessel is berthed in LA County. So those two forms of identification work good for us. And that's how we uh, make sure that we are only accepting um, participants from our county. And it's not because we don't want to um, welcome other counties into our event. It's just that we have budget costs and we have to make sure that we're not going to go over budget by accepting waste from um, everyone in the state. So it, it is expensive. Yeah, I don't. Uh, one thing that I also wanted to say is <clears throat> the counties are trying to be as flexible and as a um, welcoming as possible, right? So they would say, please, if you have your boat in this county, even if you are not a resident of the county, or if you are a resident of the county, you are also welcome. And you know, John, that people, I can live here in San Francisco, and probably my boat would, wouldn't be here. I will have my boat right. probably in Santa Cruz. So that's why the marinas, uh, uh, the partners uh, like Christian and Jalin, when they organize it, the events, they realize, Okay, this is the dynamic of the voters, right? One thing that is very important also to notice is that there are regulation in terms of how much solid waste you can transport in your car. And it's not because the state or the federal government, because in this case, will be a DOT uh, regulation wants to protect you. And you know that it is dangerous to be carrying sure. hundreds and hundreds of pounds of a explosives that are potentially leaching in your car because you can generate a horrible accident. What if you, you know, get involved in an accident? So that's why there are some limitations. Um, and these events also set up though, keep in mind uh, those limits in terms of the pounds that you can drive from one area to the other to avoid people putting the people into risk because that's a higher liability. Um, I don't know, Dallin, if you wanted to say something before we go to a question that is in the chat. Not too much, but yeah, a lot of the events that CPSC is working with were directly funded by CalRecycle, and CalRecycle has very specific rules 
about what we're allowed to accept. So we also do what Christian does, we check um, whether they're either living in the county or their vote of birth there because we're restricted by CowerCycle to only accept um, things and provide um, the flares to residents that are within the county of jurisdictions. But we do, there are some exceptions, like for Del Mar, we will expand it to Humboldt, but it really is up to what we can get approved by CowerCycle and what the county wants. So, uh, and and then I'll, I'll close with, with, with this. So rather than just saying, no, your boat's not in the county and you don't live in the county and we don't want them hoarding this stuff in, the, in their garage, what's the, the right response? Take it to the fire department? No, or no that's, yeah. So probably you saw in my email that in case if, yours, if your county or your local municipality is not offering, unfortunately, an, a temporary event, which I, we know that is not ideal, to call DTSC, the Department of Toxic Substances Control, <clears throat> because they are the agency in terms of managing, uh, they are in charge of explosives. They can guide you in what to do. Um, it's not an easy solution, again, because again, we don't have a permanent program and we know, but I usually tell people we're not perfect, but believe me that the work that California has done federally speaking, thanks to all these efforts and the research we started 10 years ago, it's just phenomenal. I know it's not the best, but we are going baby steps. So again, just to recap, if you have somebody who needs to get rid of the uh, flares and they don't have a temporary event, they can call DTSC for a better Department of Toxic Substances Control, sorry for the acronym, just to get a better guidance in terms of that. Sometimes also, as John, you mentioned, that sometimes the fire departments and the police stations, sometimes they do take. So we don't want to encourage everybody to say, go crazy and call your fire department and your police right. because we're going to overwhelm them. But sometimes they are like, okay, we can take them, but it's not the case because they will be dealing with the same. They need permits and they need a lot of other staff, right? We have a, a chat and the question here, uh, uh, Steve Caldero, he's with Sirius Signal and he's asking, will California implement a recycling fee on marine flares <clears throat> as there is on uh, tires or batteries? And I would like probably Jalin just to respond. Um, we cannot get involved into changing legislation because I work for the state. So I don't know, Yalin, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, we're currently trying to um, reassess what we want to do marine flares. And so as CPC, we're always focused on um, doing producer responsibility. And so making sure that cost is not on the, um, you know, the consumers, but rather on the producers. And so we're talking about it, but we're not confirmed. So I don't want to say anything yet until we've confirmed about it. But you should know um, when the next legislation cycle comes out, just keep an eye out for any marine flares. And we can talk to you directly too, if you have any ideas. I wanted to know if anybody else has a, a question um, for Christian or Jalin or myself about this, this topic. I know it's not an easy answer. Hopefully you get a grasp because that's a common question that I get pretty much every month about the flares, even from Coast Guard, which is fascinating to see the question coming from them. <laughs> uh, what to do with the flares? Uh, but again, the other states are looking at us because we are the only state currently funding temporary collection events that have been done fully legally, following all the, the permits that Yalin and Christian, actually Christian, explain. And as you can see, it's very, very tough to conduct those events because these are low explosives. And the category of, of the hazardous waste classification is pretty strict. Yes, John. Hi, Vivian. It's uh, Anthony Cavelli. Oh, hi, Anthony. <clears throat> uh, hello, everyone. I want to say how much I've enjoyed uh, hearing everyone present um, on disposal of flares. And there's something, uh, kind of a light bulb went off in my head. And I know there are some um, legislators, administrators, and stuff in this group today. But you know, the simplest part about this, before we think about the overwhelming problem of disposal, is the endorsement by the state of California and the agencies to preference the carriage of distress signals that are non-pyrotechnic. 
the Department of Boating and Waterways publishes the ABCs of California Boating, um, and it's an online publication. Um, they could easily mention that it should be the preference of the state as a whole that boaters carry non-pyrotechnic uh, devices. Um, you know, there are obviously many manufacturers that make these, and it would begin at least the process of boaters being aware that that's what the state preference is, right? And until there's something legislative in play that defines what boaters you know, would be required to carry. It just seems that cleaning up the confusion that the boater has, either taking the boater card examination or the publications that the state has themselves that don't offer a direction to the boater. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And I can respond to that question. The current ABCs that are in circulation haven't been updated for the last four years. So of course, they are not up to date. That's why I included in the chat the fact sheet that includes, as you can see on the back of the or the second page, the options that I just shared with you in terms of the non pyrotechnic devices, because you know, they came, as you know, fa fa like in the last few years. So the publication ABCs hasn't been updated. That's why the information is not reflected there. However, our website in the fact sheet that I included for all of you and the collection events and the presentations we give at uh, 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 yacht clubs and marine associations across the state now are showing what is the, I would say, more modern information and the options. And as you know, we try to share with the, our partner dock walkers, uh, the partners like the Coast Guard Auxiliary and the Power Squadrons, all those options allow flares, as you know, Anthony. So we're doing that on a multifaceted approach from different angles, but the publication will be eventually um, uh, updated once we're done with the ones that we have in storage. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I think, don't feel bad, the federal publication hasn't been updated in even longer than the California one. But, you know, I think if we start at the top with giving the information to the voter on the educational, these are new voters coming in, right? And, you know, let them know that this is the preference, not only is it, you know, high tech and is it perhaps a better solution for them, but the state needs to put their weight behind and say, this is what we recommend, the state of California recommends. And that's a start, right? Yeah, sure. That, that's why we do this education. And that's why we have the, the, the fact sheet just to show the proper best management practices for voters and what options are available. John, you had a question too. Yeah, yeah. Just just to follow up, and then I, I promise we'll move forward. Uh, <laughs> and, and Anthony, you you bring up a, a great point, and and just for everybody's awareness, uh, in the Coast Guard Auxiliary, one of the mission areas that we have is to be the distributor of the ABCs of boating. So if uh, your Coast Guard Auxiliarist local hasn't made it down you know, to replenish those. We've just started back, uh, you know, four or five months ago, making it to the marinas to make sure that everybody has one as well as, you know, through the lakes and, and the parks department. Um, the, the other item is that the reason this is an issue is one of the other mission areas that we do as a courtesy service for, for boaters in California is we perform vessel exams. And guess what one of the questions is? You know, are your flares within the within the date? Are they not expired? And, and of course, you know, so part of this is kind of circular logic. We're driving, you know, some of this stuff that that ends up in in events. And I and I'm uh, hopeful that going forward, you know, the counties that really need need them, you know, uh, uh, San Mateo and working with Vivian's team um, to move forward and and ultimately, you know, get that language added. Th thanks for your time and thank thanks Vivian. No, no problem. And that's why we put together all these educational opportunities for people to ask, uh, disseminate via our website, etc. So there's a lot to come and especially to educate the public about what options and best management practices are out there. So I'm checking the time and I and we said we were going to finish at 10, 12, 10. And you guys are excited about this topic. And I just want to uh, make sure that we don't have any other questions. I'm just checking here in Georgia is also checking uh, and I don't see more questions. I don't know if um, uh, Jalino or Christian, do you have 
some final words before we close up the, the meeting? No, just thank you for your time. Oh, no, no, pleasure. And Yalin, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I'm all good. Thank you. Okay, well, so thank you everybody for joining our California Clean Voting Network meeting. Uh, thank you to uh, our partners, all the speakers. Uh, this is recorded and once uh, it finishes downloading all the uh, video, we will post it in our YouTube channel. So I can share with uh, you and also people who couldn't join us today. Anything uh, you need, please make sure that you uh, even link the new fact sheet into your website, help us spread the word out. We will share all the resources from all the wonderful speakers we had today. And thank you for your time. And I hope you all have a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving and holidays. And thank you for your time and all the work you all do. Thank you so much. Good job.